Hello everyone, welcome to this webinar. Thank you very much for joining us. My name is Titus Kurek. Uh, I'm a product manager at Canonical. And uh, today, together with my colleague, uh, Josh Powers, uh, who's an engineering manager at the Ubuntu Server team, uh, we're going to talk about everything new in Ubuntu Server 2004 LTS. Uh, Ubuntu Server 2004 is the latest uh, Ubuntu Server release. Uh, it was released uh, a week ago uh, and it's already available for download. So you can download it, uh, try it. If you're using Ubuntu Server in a production, you can already start planning uh, for the upgrade. And uh, we're absolutely excited uh, about this release because it brings uh, a lot of uh, improvements and exciting features that enhance Ubuntu Server across uh, multiple areas. This is also the first webinar in the series of uh, webinars about uh, Ubuntu Server 2004. So you can watch carefully on what becomes available uh, at Bright Talk. We're also going to point uh, some uh, following webinars that will be hosted uh, later on. And as we progress through the content, you can raise your questions at any time. Uh, you don't necessarily have to wait until the Q&A session at the end. There's a question box uh, at the Bright Talk platform. So if you have a question, you can raise your question at any time. We're going to navigate through the following items, which also translate uh, into the three primary values brought by Ubuntu Server 2004. And those are stability, security, and new features. Being an LTS release, Ubuntu Server 2004 is going to be supported for up to 10 years, which is extremely important for people who are using Ubuntu in production environments. Uh, it makes it an ideal candidate for production deployments. On the security side, Ubuntu is secure out of the box. It is one of the most secure Linux distributions across the world. Uh, but also this release brings a lot of new enhancements towards security, both in the kernel space and the user space. So we're going to discuss that. And uh, finally, it brings a lot of new features uh, which enhance Ubuntu Server uh, across uh, various areas. So we're going to discuss those features one by one. Before we get started, let me say a couple of words about uh, Ubuntu itself. Uh, so as you probably know, Ubuntu is a Linux distribution that is based on Debian, but uh, it is designed uh, to be user-friendly. And uh, especially Ubuntu Server is designed for developers and IT operations teams. So why is this topic important? Why is uh, Ubuntu important? Why may it be important for you? Well, this is because uh, Ubuntu is everywhere. Uh, it is in public clouds. It powers from 60 to 80% of workloads running on top of public clouds. Uh, but uh, Ubuntu is also in private clouds. Uh, Ubuntu is the most popular uh, operating system used as a basis for OpenStack deployments. Uh, it is also used uh, as a basis for Kubernetes deployments. And uh, due to its lightweight architecture, most of the container images are based on Ubuntu. But Ubuntu is also available on desktops, Edge, and IoT. So Ubuntu is everywhere. And this is why this topic is important. One of the biggest advantages of Ubuntu Server 2004 LTS is the stability that it brings. And uh, this stability comes through the fact that 2004 is an LTS release and LTS stands for long-term support. What does it mean in practice? Well, it means that uh, Ubuntu Server 2004 LTS uh, provides up to 10 years of support, which is uh, very long, very long period of time. As you probably know, Ubuntu is released every six months. However, the interim releases of uh, Ubuntu are supported only for nine months. However, every two years, there is an LTS release of Ubuntu that is supported for five years by default. But commercial customers uh, who are covered under the Ubuntu Advantage uh, support subscription can subscribe for an extended security maintenance package that provides uh, additional five years of support. 
So this results in 10 years of support, and this is what Ubuntu Server 2004 brings, which makes it extremely stable and suitable for production deployments. Apart from the stability, uh, Ubuntu Server 2004 also brings uh, security, and uh, this is coming from the fact that uh, Ubuntu is one of the most secure Linux distributions. So it's secure out of the box, but also being an LTS, it provides uh, up to 10 years of support, uh, which includes security patches. So in practice, it provides up to 10 years of security. Ubuntu always comes with a newer stable kernel that also brings uh, various security extensions and improvements. This is not any different this time, and we're going to discuss certain features uh, which uh, are coming in the new stable kernel that is included in 2004. Also applying a prioritization process towards uh, common vulnerabilities and exposures and uh, uh, applying security patches 24/7. Uh, uh, it is one of the Linux distributions with the fastest reaction time towards uh, common vulnerabilities and exposures. All of those patches can be automatically applied towards uh, Ubuntu server instances through the automatic security updates. It includes up armor for mandatory access control, kernel live patch service for commercial customers who are covered under the Ubuntu Advantage support subscription. Kernel Live Patch Service allows to update the kernel of the operating system without uh, the need to reboot the host. It provides a secure snap packages repository and uh, various security extensions that we will discuss later on. So the stability and security values are coming from the fact that uh, Ubuntu Server 2004 is an LTS uh, release of Ubuntu. But uh, 2004 brings a lot of enhancements and new features on its own. So this is what we're going to discuss in the following sections of this webinar. So first of all, Ubuntu Server 2004 LTS uh, supports uh, all major architectures, including uh, x86-64, uh, ARM64, ARM v7, Power8, Power9, and uh, IBM S390X, uh, which uh, means that you can run it on top of almost any hardware, especially the hardware commonly used uh, to build the infrastructure part of the data center. But uh, starting with the 2004 release, uh, Ubuntu Server also provides an initial support for uh, RISC-V, which is an uh, open standard uh, infrastructure set architecture based on established uh, RISC principles. Um, that's provided under open source uh, licenses. So this is a new thing in 2004, and we're uh, absolutely proud to provide this initial support for RISC-V. There have been some major updates to key software components that uh, build the Ubuntu server uh, software stack. Uh, those include QEMU and LibVirt for virtualization, Ruby and Python for development and uh, development frameworks. MySQL as uh, one of the most popular database uh, uh, platforms on Linux. Uh, Nginx, uh, one of the most popular uh, web servers for Linux. And also PHP and uh, GCC. Uh, in general, Ubuntu strives to be at the forefront of the technology, always supporting the uh, latest software versions, so this is not any different uh, this time. And at this point, I'm going to hand over to Josh, who will walk you through more uh, technical features that are coming with uh, Ubuntu Server 2004 LTS. Um, just as a reminder that uh, you can put your questions in a question box at any time. Uh, you don't necessarily have to wait until the Q&A session. So if you have a question, you can put it uh, in the question box uh, even now. Over to you, Josh. Thanks, Titus, for that introduction. Hello, everyone, and thanks for being here. With each new release of Ubuntu comes new features and functionality. Now I'm going to start by talking about the Linux kernel. Included in Ubuntu 2004, it's kernel version 5.4. With each new release of the kernel comes additional hardware support, features, 
and bug fixes. We also work with hardware vendors such as Intel, AMD, IBM, NVIDIA, Mellanox, and of course others to ensure the latest drivers and hardware support are included on top of what might already be there. The first of two new features I want to mention is support for WireGuard. WireGuard is a VPN solution that runs as a Linux kernel module. It was only recently accepted into upstream kernel with version 5.5. However, we have backported it into 2004 to make it available in our new LTS. Thanks to the ease of setting up WireGuard, the state-of-the-art cryptography support, and the speed advantages of the kernel module, we are excited to deliver WireGuard with 2004. The second feature is around updates to ZFS. Folk will include ZFS version 0.8.3. Included with this version come native encryption with hardware acceleration, device removal, pool trim, and finally sequential scrub and resilver for a large increase to performance. Finally, security. The critical security issues discovered in both hardware and the kernel over the last couple of years have allowed our kernel and security teams to demonstrate their ability to quickly deliver fixes. Each LTS includes five years of security support and another five years after that as part of our extended security maintenance. TTIS already went over some of the new major software versions in 2004. I wanted to call out three user space areas and features that were now included in 2004. First, in terms of security and hardening, I'm particularly excited about Fast Identity Online FIDO and Universal Second Factor, or UTF, device support with SSH. By enabling these devices, we give users the ability to further move away from passwords and use hardware devices combined with SSH keys for a stronger and simplified security experience. Next, taking a look at virtualization, speed is the story. QMU and LiveVirt come with increased hardware limits, faster migrations, and greater NVMe support for even faster virtual machines. Additionally, we have included a new ROM and machine type and a minimized QMU build that will allow users for, to launch even faster x86 VMs. Finally, on the high availability front, we took the time to dig deep and update the entire stack. From ChronosNet, CoroSync, and Pacemaker, all the packages got major updates. A lot of effort went into provide these new versions, bug fixes, and updated documentation. Turning to the cloud, Ubuntu 2004 images are already available across the largest public cloud providers. As we make Ubuntu even stronger in the cloud, here are some of the new features and products we've been working hard on. On AWS, we have enabled support for the latest AMD and ARM-based computing types to provide optimized cost and performance for scale workloads. We added the ability to use version 2 of the instance metadata service on AWS for even more secure instance bring up and enabled Amazon's Instance Connect feature integration into Ubuntu images. Ubuntu instances also use a custom kernel for increased performance and stability. Turning to Microsoft Azure, we added support for AMD instance types as well as our Gen 2 instance types that provide UEFI support. We are currently participating in the Azure Confidential Computing Preview, which will enable Secure Boot. Ubuntu support will be ready to go once that feature is released. Ubuntu not only provides a custom kernel, but a rolling, rolling custom kernel, so users will always have the latest version with all the latest features on Azure. Users on Azure will also be able to take advantage of greater IPv6 support out of the box, due to updates to Cloud Init, and take advantage of the automatic time configuration using Microsoft's own Stratum 1 time service. On GCE, Ubuntu users will find a rolling kernel as well for the latest features and versions. Support for shielded VMs to enable UEFI and Secure Boot is also added. And on Google Kubernetes Engine, GKE, we provide Ubuntu node images also with GPU enablement. On IBM Cloud, there are Ubuntu images for x86 and Power already available. Additionally, there are Ubuntu 2004 images available for IBM Power and Z images ready for download. Finally, on Oracle, we provide a custom kernel now. In addition to that, I also wanted to point out our minimal images. We offer these on AWS, GCE, Azure, and Oracle. If you're looking for an even smaller image with a smaller footprint, 
or a reduced attack footprint, then consider using these images. They include a slimmed down packet set, each with an optimized kernel and boot process targeted at the specific cloud. And finally, users can find our new Ubuntu Pro images on AWS and Azure. These images take a standard Ubuntu image and provide key security and compliance subscriptions automatically enabled out of the box. Going from the cloud to bare metal, I want to talk about the Ubuntu Server Live Installer. We initially released the new installer with 18.04, and now with 20.04, the Live Installer is the default installer across all architectures for Ubuntu Server. The Live Installer provides a much cleaner and faster user experience. There are two new key features with 20.04 that I want to talk about. The first is the ability for the installer to update itself. This is a very unique and exciting feature. Typically, users have to wait for each point release of Ubuntu to get an update to the installer. Now users do not have to wait. You can get the latest bug fixes or features for the installer itself as soon as we publish them. How this works is if the user has an internet connection, the installer will check for any updates. If so, the user will be prompted to update. If an update is selected, the update will be downloaded, installed, and the installer will resume right where it left off. The second cool new feature is the auto install functionality. The live installer now has the ability to, to automate the entire install end to end. The automation can be added in a couple different ways and enables all sorts of customization, providing even more flexibility. Over the last two years, we have added additional features around LVM, RAID, and other advanced storage configuration options, as well as other advanced networking configuration options to cover more complex scenarios. Please give the new server Live installer a try today. I hope you enjoy the new user experience. I also want to mention big updates to MultiPass and LexD. First, with MultiPass, you can launch a mini cloud of Ubuntu virtual machines on your Linux, Mac OS, or Windows based system. This is a fantastic way to quickly develop locally using Ubuntu, no matter what platform you're running on top of. MultiPass will boot using the native hypervisor of your platform, whether that is Hyper V on Windows. HyperKit on Mac OS, and KVM on, on Linux. If those are not available, Multipass can also make use of VirtualBox. All of this is done is to ensure the fastest startup time along with a custom-tuned Ubuntu kernel for each hypervisor to provide the best I.O. and performance. Release 1.1 was a few weeks ago and again is available for Windows, Mac OS, and Linux. You can learn more about the project on the website multipass.run. For those of you not familiar, LexD containers provide a fully functional OS that is running on a file system and brings the same performance and latency as application containers, but with increased security and have optimized resource consumption. With the recently released version 4.0, users can now launch virtual machines in addition to containers, all with the same clean user experience. The new release also added projects to help users organize their containers and now VMs. Combined with a role-based access control, users can expand the adoption to those needing more fine-tuned access controls. For an excellent getting starting guide and to even try LexD out, check out the Linux Containers website. Finally, I want to invite users and the community to get involved and help us with Ubuntu Server. We have a discourse forum set up with an Ubuntu Server section where users can respond to proposed new features, hear of upcoming changes, and provide their own ideas and feedback directly to the developers of Ubuntu Server. Our server guide was completely revamped for Focal and is now available on Ubuntu.com. With a big facelift and an easy way to contribute via the discourse forum, the server guide is better than ever. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoy using Ubuntu 2004 and we look forward to your feedback. And with that, I'd like to hand it back to Tibas. Thank you very much, Josh. That was awesome. So now, as we've learned about uh, all of the new features that came with uh, Ubuntu Server 2004 LTS, let's talk about uh, some next steps. So where can you go from here to start your journey with uh, Ubuntu Server 2004? So the first thing I would like to encourage you to do right after this webinar is to download it and try it. Ubuntu Server 2004 was released a week ago, so it is already available for a download. Uh, you can just go to ubuntu.com slash server slash download uh, and download an image for uh, your computer. And you can 
install it on your workstation on an, any spare server that you have or just use multipass to launch a virtual machine with uh, 2004 or try it in a public cloud and basically experiment with all of the new features uh, that came with the latest release. And uh, once you experiment with them, uh, I would uh, encourage you to provide a feedback. You can always go to the new uh, Ubuntu server guide at uh, ubuntu.com slash server slash docs slash reporting bugs and uh, report any bug that uh, you may potentially face. Your feedback, your honest feedback is always appreciated by us. The next step after trying Ubuntu Server 2004 LTS would be to plan for the upgrade. If you are using Ubuntu Server in a production, I can imagine two situations. Either all of your workloads and infrastructure components are running on top of uh, Ubuntu Server 19.10 at the moment, or you're at uh, Ubuntu Server 18.04 LTS, which is the previous uh, Ubuntu LTS release. So first of all, both upgrade paths are fully supported, but the actual upgrade plan may depend on what are you using Ubuntu for and uh, what, what are the actual workloads that are running on top. So uh, it may differ depending on whether you're just running some applications uh, on Ubuntu server in a public cloud or whether all of your infrastructure components such as uh, private cloud, for example, OpenStack, Kubernetes, Ceph, uh, are deployed on top of uh, Ubuntu. So in order to help you design the upgrade plan and upgrade to Ubuntu Server 2004 without pain, uh, we're going to host another webinar that's going to be titled Migrating Your Infrastructure to Ubuntu 2004 LTS, How, When and Why. So I would encourage you to watch Bright Talk carefully and uh, register for this webinar as soon as it becomes uh, available. This is where we're talking about the upgrade plan for the migration from previous Ubuntu releases to 2004, and we'll address all of those concerns. Another important topic to mention is OpenStack Usuri release uh, that is coming soon. So you may be wondering uh, why are we talking about OpenStack during the Ubuntu server uh, webinar. Uh, and the answer is pretty straightforward. So at Canonical, we see a lot of organizations running their OpenStack private cloud infrastructure on top of Ubuntu server. So those topics are uh, kind of correlated and also the release cadence of OpenStack is correlated with uh, the release cadence of uh, Ubuntu. So OpenStack Usuri is coming in May uh, and it's going to be an LTS release of uh, OpenStack on Ubuntu in the same way that Ubuntu Server 2004 is an LTS release. So if you would be interested in listening about all of the new features that are coming in OpenStack Usuri, I would like to invite you to join another webinar that's titled OpenStack Usuri, what's new? It is also worth mentioning that the development cycle for Ubuntu 20.10 has already begun. As uh, it was uh, said previously in this webinar, uh, Ubuntu is released every six months uh, with uh, LTS uh, releases being available every two years. So being an LTS, 2004 is going to follow with 20.10, which will be an interim release. Uh, it will be supported for nine months, but is also going to include a lot of new features uh, that will be delivered during the following uh, development cycle. So I hope to see all of you in October during the webinar about Ubuntu Server 20.10. And finally, I'd like to encourage you to migrate to Ubuntu if you're not in Ubuntu yet, because there are certain reasons why you would like to migrate to Ubuntu from any other Linux distribution that you are using. Uh, so first of all, it's 100% open source. There's no license required. You probably know all of that. Ubuntu applies a predictable release cadence and a very clear upgrade path. So if you're using, uh, if, if you're running your workloads in production, uh, you can always expect when is the, re the new release of Ubuntu going to happen. Uh, you can plan for the upgrade in advance and uh, this plan becomes valid uh, whenever you're upgrading to 2004 
or you'll be upgrading to 2204 or, or 2404 uh, in the future because uh, the release cadence does not change. Uh, it is also one of the most secure Linux distributions and operating systems in general, which makes it an ideal candidate for production deployments. It powers various infrastructure components such as OpenStack, Kubernetes, public clouds, uh, devices and more. It's, it's Ubuntu is everywhere and uh, standardizing on a single platform uh, allows you to keep the codes under control and uh, make the budget uh, fully predictable and transparent. And uh, last but not least is an enterprise Linux distribution because it provides a commercial support for enterprise customers under the Ubuntu Advantage support subscription. And uh, Ubuntu Advantage support subscription includes all of the necessary services to run workloads uh, in a production. And those include uh, production grade SLAs, phone and ticket support, uh, extended security maintenance, kernel live patch, uh, and much, much more. And that's basically all for today. We would like to thank you all very much for your attention. As a next step after this webinar, we would like to encourage you to go to ubuntu.com slash download slash server. Download the latest version of uh, Ubuntu server, try it and provide your feedback. And now we'll be more than happy to answer any questions that you may have. Thanks very much for that, Josh and Titus. Uh, we've already had quite a lot of questions come in, so we'll start going through them uh, now and hopefully we'll manage to get through them all. Uh, for anyone who hasn't managed to get a question into us yet, there's still time. So just write your question in the dialogue box on the Bright Talk platform and hopefully we'll be able to get to it. Um, we do have a lot of questions, so if we don't get around to answering your question, it's worth noting that we've included a link to contact us in the attachment section um, where we've all also provided a few other relevant webinars, pieces of content, and also uh, the link to download Ubuntu 2004. So it's definitely worth checking out. Um, so, Josh, Titus, that's all the housekeeping we have. If you're ready, we'll just go ahead and dive right into the questions. Let's go. Perfect. So, the first question we have is, I'm surprised not to see anything about Ubuntu Pro images. What are the plans for Ubuntu Pro 2004? Okay, uh, I think I can cover this one. So, uh, yes, uh, Ubuntu Pro is uh, one of our recent initiatives uh, uh, to provide uh, images for public clouds that are designed for production and professionals. Uh, and those images uh, contain uh, certain features that are like based on the uh, all of the goodness of regular Ubuntu images, but also bring features like uh, kernel light patch or uh, hardening. Uh, so uh, they are, as I said, designed for, for production and professionals. Uh, we didn't explicitly talk about uh, Ubuntu Pro in this webinar because uh, this is not, re not really part of the 2004 uh, launch. So uh, the Ubuntu Pro images for the previous LTS releases are already available uh, in the marketplaces of uh, the supported public clouds, but the an image for 2004 LTS will be available shortly. Perfect. Thank you, Titus. The next question we have is, do you provide any centralized management tool for Ubuntu, something similar to Red Hat Satellite? I think I can cover this one as well. So yes, we have a centralized uh, monitoring and management tool uh, similar to uh, Red Hat Satellite. It's called uh, Landscape. Um, so this tool provides uh, traditional operating system administration for uh, bare metal uh, Ubuntu machines, uh, legacy containers based on Ubuntu and, and virtual machines. Um, it has uh, a package repository management uh, uh, with a support for offline deployments as well, security, audit reports, uh, compliance, uh, everything that's required to uh, monitor and manage uh, Ubuntu server uh, instances centrally from a single place. It's called Landscape. Brilliant, thank you. Uh, next question, I guess, is one for Josh. Um, so you mentioned that the development cycle for 2010 has already started. Could you please briefly talk on what's going to come next and what does the roadmap for 2010 look like? 
Yeah, so I wanted to first thank everyone for downloading and already upgrading to 2004. Um, for those of you that have already done it, we already have some feedback ideas and, and bugs coming in that we want to tackle. Um, our next big milestone is going to be 24.1, uh, the point release, which should come, should come out at the end of July. Um, and some of the areas that we want to tackle with that are around uh, the installer, um, trying to get minimal installs into the installer, as well as some additional hardware enablement um, features uh, there. And as I mentioned earlier, uh, once we have those features released into Subiquity, uh, you'll get prompted to update the, the installer that you already have, and you can take advantage of these features even before the point release um, happens um, as soon as we land them in master and release them. Um, other areas that we're looking to beyond the point release um, is just greater uh, support with NetPlan around OpenB switch um, and other features that we haven't been able to quite get in yet. Um, and you heard me mention ZFS, um, and I think one of the areas that we're looking into, we're still investigating what, what that would look like, would be ZFS on root. Um, on the desktop side, that installer already allows you to experience that um, and then deploy a, a new system with ZFS on root. And so we want to do the same thing with server. And so going through the initial investigation steps into looking at what that would take um, and, and how to deliver that best to our, our users. Awesome. Thank you, Josh. The next question is, how does the Ubuntu Advantage support subscription you mentioned differ from the managed applications in this initiative announced by Canonical recently? Oh, I see. So, uh, yeah, let me take this one as well. So, uh, Ubuntu Advantage uh, is a commercial support uh, subscription that's available for enterprises uh, who are running uh, Ubuntu in uh, production environments. Uh, so, what 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 does uh, Ubuntu Advantage uh, include? Uh, I think it was uh, briefly highlighted uh, during the webinar, but just to recap, uh, it's uh, security patches. Uh, phone and email support, uh, kernel live patch, uh, and uh, extended security maintenance. Uh, all of that coming with uh, production-grade uh, SLAs as required by the enterprises. While what you are referring to, the managed applications, uh, is our new initiative that was uh, announced, I think, uh, at the beginning of uh, April. Uh, that is aimed to provide the actual uh, ongoing operations for applications when running on top of uh, Ubuntu. So uh, in, like Ubuntu Advantage is a support subscription, while the managed offering is is that we take the risk, we uh, like the actual uh, maintenance, uh, monitoring and maintenance of the application running on top of Ubuntu is fully transferred to a dedicated team of uh, IT experts at Canonical, who will take care of all daily uh, maintenance tasks, such as monitoring incident, uh, re incident resolution, problem resolution, uh, upgrades, uh, and, and, and things like that. So uh, if you'd be interested in hearing more about uh, managed application offering, I would encourage you to uh, contact us directly. There is, um, a, there is a link to the contact us uh, uh, in the attachment. Just to add to that, uh, we also have a Managed Apps webinar which aired last week. So if you look in our uh, Canonical Bright Talk channel, you'll be able to view that for some more information on Managed Apps as well. Um, so moving on to the next question, uh, how about LXD? Is it discontinued in favor of Kubernetes? It's absolutely not discontinued, and uh, as you could see, uh, like LexD comes uh, like Ubuntu Server 2004 comes with LexD version uh, 4.0. So uh, we continue to see the value in both. Uh, the difference between LexD containers and uh, process containers is that uh, inside of LexD containers you can run multiple processes, while uh, uh, process containers such as Docker. Uh, are are optimized for running a single process uh, in a container. But uh, we are actively using LexD for uh, our uh, infrastructure, like for our core infrastructure products like uh, OpenStack, uh, for example, the entire 
OpenStack control plane is uh, containerized using legacy containers. Uh, on the other side, we continue to see uh, an, an increasing popularity of uh, process containers and the underlying uh, container coordination platforms like uh, Kubernetes. So we continue to uh, develop our uh, commercial Kubernetes uh, distribution, uh, current Kubernetes, Microcade, uh, which is designed for uh, workstation and uh, edge devices. But we also cooperate with public clouds to support uh, people who are running uh, their workloads uh, on top of uh, uh, EKS or, or any other solutions like that in a public cloud. Uh, thanks, Titus. Uh, whilst, we're, whilst we're on the topic, we have another question, um, which is, can one combine running LXD containers and Docker containers on the same host? Yes, this is absolutely possible. So as I said, uh, for example, in the case of uh, OpenStack, uh, our, our Chand OpenStack deployment where the entire uh, control plane is containerized using Lexi containers, uh, we, what, what we promote is uh, so-called hyper-converged uh, architecture for OpenStack where uh, OpenStack control services are co-hosted together with uh, compute and storage services. So uh, you you have uh, legacy containers spread across the cluster, and there are uh, OpenStack control services running uh, inside of those le le legacy containers. While what you can have running on the top uh, uh, of OpenStack is Kubernetes, uh, and, and we actually consider Kubernetes more like a feature of uh, the underlying uh, cloud infrastructure than a uh, completely new solution or, or an exclusive solution. And you can have uh, process containers, uh, Docker containers running uh, running uh, on top of Kubernetes. So at the end, all of that results with uh, legacy containers and process containers running uh, on the same host. Uh, so yes, it's absolutely possible. Super, thank you. The next question is, can you please refer to the upgrade procedure from 18.10? Yeah, I can take that one. Um, so if you're interested in upgrading, um, what you would want to do from 18.10 is you're going to have to upgrade to the um, intermediate releases and then get to the LTS. So uh, do release upgrade is, is command um, on, on a server with no desktop environment, um, and it will walk you through the upgrade process to safely get you to 20.04. Um, for people who are on 19.10, so the previous development release, um, same thing applies, just to do release upgrade, and they can do that now. Um, for customers and users who are on 18.04, the previous LTS release, um, they will start seeing uh, update notifications and, and advertisements about 20.04 being available to upgrade at the point release. Um, obviously, if they want to try upgrading now, uh, and, and make the leap they can. There's nothing stopping you from doing that. Again, the do release upgrade command is, is what you're after there. Great, thank you, Josh. The next question is, how does Live Patch work? Can I use it in a normal standalone laptop? Yes, yeah, so uh, the kernel live patch service uh, is a service that allows to uh, update the uh, kernel uh, without the need to reboot uh, the uh, computer, uh, whether it's a workstation such as laptop or, or a production server. So uh, yes, you can absolutely use it on your laptop, and we, uh, of course, recommend uh, using it uh, on, on your workstations uh, when running Ubuntu. Um, and uh, it is available free of charge for up to three machines. So uh, you can go to uh, you can go to ubuntu.com slash live patch and you will find uh, instructions on how to enable it on your laptop. Uh, and you can absolutely use it free of charge up to three machines. Super, thank you. The next question is uh, can you please provide more information about the high avail availability of Ubuntu 20.04 LTS? As I understand, all updates can be applied without reboots. Is that correct? Yeah, I'll take that one. Um, so, like I said earlier, we did a lot of improvements with the HA stack, getting the packages uh, one by one updated, solving lots of bugs, um, being able to pull in new features. 
um, to, to offer along with this release of this LTS. Um, you still do need to do uh, reboots uh, for some updates, right? Um, we offer the canonical live batch service, which is what Titus was just talking about, um, to be able to deliver the latest kernel updates uh, to users and to be able to keep them going and, and, and reduce downtime. Um, so if you're interested in, in not having to reboot it often enough, then you should, should consider that and look into that. However, there are some updates that still require a reboot. Um, and these, we kind of refer to them as flag days that, that happen every once in a while where um, we can't quite live patch something and we need to actually go through and, and, and do a full system reboot to, to load the updates. Brilliant. Next question is, does Ubuntu 20.04 have support for AWS Graviton CPU instances? Yeah, I can take that one as well. Uh, so AWS uh, announced their Graviton, which is the ARM-based uh, processor instance types um, at reInvent. Uh, we do produce an ARM64 uh, cloud image that's available in the marketplace for use. And so users who are interested in trying out these really cool, really new uh, instance types um, are free to, to use those ARM images as well as the AMD64 images that we already offer today. Um, for the Intel as well as AMD based instance types. Thank you. The next question is um, Can you recommend a UI to manage virtualization? Yeah, if you're just getting started or you want something graphical to help manage some virtual machines, the simple answer is uh, looking at BERT Manager um, and being able to quickly clone, create, and delete virtual machines um, is, is an option. Um, I would also suggest if you're just trying some, some machines locally, that's a perfect use case for multipath. Um, and being able to build your own cloud or your own set of virtual machines on your, your local system um, with multipath, not only does, is the UI really simple, or the, excuse me, the CLI really simple to use and really fast to, to learn, um, there is a little bit of a GUI uh, that will help you be able to, to launch things quickly um, if, you're, if you're just getting started with it. Thanks, Josh. And the next question, I'm not sure if I'm reading this correctly, but uh, I interpret it as, um, when can you automatically update from 1804 LTS to 2004 LTS? Yes. Yeah, so, yeah, so Okay. Let 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 me start with that, and Josh, maybe you uh, you you want to add uh, some sense uh, to that. So uh, yeah, first of all, I, I'm not sure I totally understand the question. So uh, there's a difference between updates and upgrades, uh, obviously. So you can uh, update uh, your uh, Ubuntu packages at any given time, uh, and uh, you can enable automatic uh, security updates, for example. But with regards to upgrades, when we are changing like uh, the underlying uh, uh, version of the operating system, and we are uh, migrating from uh, 1804 LTS to 2004 LTS. Uh, this is a major step, and obviously, uh, this is not something that uh, we would recommend uh, making an automatic option. So that uh, imagine you are running uh, your production servers, which are based on 1804. And uh, you wake up in the morning, and uh, suddenly you find that they are now running uh, 2004. Um, so, uh, the, the, like changing, uh, changing, migrating from one LTS to another LTS is a big step, and uh, it like this step has to be uh, thought through, and uh, a lot of considerations have to be taken uh, before uh, the migration. Uh, we're going to hold a separate uh, webinar about uh, migration from uh, uh, from the previous LTS version to 2004, and this is where uh, all of those uh, all of these kind of concerns uh, will be addressed. Uh, do you want to add anything to what I said, Josh? Nope. Just uh, another comment that again at the 2004.1 point release, that's when users will get notified about the the 2004 release, start hearing about it more, um, and at that point they can they can choose they can choose today to upgrade once they've touched everything as well. Thanks guys. Uh, the next question is 
Where is the documentation for automated installation? Right, so uh, with Subiquity or the live installer, uh, we added the, the auto install uh, mechanisms. Users can go to the discourse pages for, for now. Um, on the discourse forum, we have a server section and we have a number of topics uh, talking about how auto install works. Um, and the plan is to get that documentation once we've finalized everything a little bit more up on the actual server guide as well. Um, but for trying it out, um, reading about it, uh, asking questions, you know, head over to the discourse forum, uh, let us know how, how it works for you, uh, read up on it, give it a shot, and uh, you can find some more information there. Perfect. The next question is, is a, is a paid support plan available in German? If so, how much does this support plan cost? Uh, again, I'm not sure I fully understand the question, so uh, I, I'm not sure whether it's a question about like is the collateral uh, about the commercial support, the paid support available in the German language. Uh, if, if that's a question, then I would uh, encourage you to uh, uh, contact us directly because uh, uh, all of our public collateral is uh, in English. Uh, so uh, with regards to the uh, support plan costs. Uh, I, I think it was briefly covered during the webinar, but uh, just to recap, so there are three versions uh, uh, of the Ubuntu Advantage for infrastructure support subscription. Uh, they are called uh, Essential, Standard, and Advanced. Uh, Essential contains bits only, so those are uh, uh, security updates, kernel life patch, uh, extended security maintenance, and so on while the standard and advanced uh, contain uh, uh, phone and uh, email support uh, and, and production grade SLAs. And it, they actually differ uh, with the SLAs only. So uh, just, just, to, just to summarize uh, on the code, so uh, the price of the uh, Ubuntu Advantage uh, support subscription uh, for essential standard and advanced is uh, 225. Uh, 750 and 1,500 uh, per node uh, per year, uh, depending on the uh, support type. Uh, there are also plans uh, for uh, virtual machines because uh, the prices I provided are for uh, physical servers. Thank you, Titus. Uh, the next question is, what is the best argument to convince business customers to invest into Ubuntu and not RHEL, which is what most enterprises know and use still? Okay, I, th I think it's a good question. So uh, we obviously appreciate uh, the uh, competition and uh, everything that uh, Red Hat is doing, uh, in, uh, uh, especially with regards to uh, broadening uh, open source and bringing it uh, to people across the world. I think uh, the, uh, the difference between, uh, the primary difference between Ubuntu and Canonical and REL uh, is uh, with uh, the business model that uh, both companies apply. So while Red Hat puts most of their efforts towards um, uh, enterprise customers, assuming uh, they can afford paying more, we care about individuals as well, uh, as we believe in the power of open source, and our mission is to bring open source to everyone across the planet. Uh, and uh, what results from those differences are the um, sub, like are the differences in the support plans. So, for example, uh, Red Hat is using uh, per socket uh, pricing model, uh, while, as I described, uh, answering the previous question, Canonical uses a per host pricing model when providing a commercial support. So, um, these results uh, uh, in, in like when the, the per Socket per pricing model uh, is something that can quickly result with the budget going uh, out of control uh, uh, as you never know how many CPUs are you actually going to have in your data center while for the per node pricing model it is much more predictable. Also the license uh, pays uh, an important role as uh, 
Ubuntu is available without any license, while most of the Red Hat tools like uh, Red Hat OpenStack Platform and Red Hat OpenShift are uh, available only per paid license. Excellent. Thanks, Titus. Um, the next question is, is Multipass aimed at R&D slash development, or would it also be suitable for deploying slash managing live servers as well? So we consider all of our products seriously and everything we're doing, uh, including tools uh, that uh, look as development tools at the first sight. And uh, this is uh, this applies to multipass, this applies to uh, microcades uh, or any other products uh, that we are working on. Uh, we see a big uh, potential in all of the tools that we are working on and uh, if you would be interested in cooperating with us um, uh, or like not maybe cooperating but if you would be interested in using multipass in the production environments we would be more than happy to help you be successful on your journey thank you um we have a, another multipass question here it's, can you briefly demo multipass and let us know if it's free or if there's a price plan So I don't think we can demo that uh, during this webinar, but uh, there are a lot of uh, webinars and, and uh, short videos available across our uh, websites. Uh, so you can always be at Ubuntu.com to check for any news. Uh, with regards to uh, pricing for my, uh, sorry, not, not micro case, but uh, multi-pass, uh, it is available free of charge. Uh, so uh, you can you can download it, uh, you can install it, and uh, uh, take benefits of uh, launching uh, Ubuntu VMs on your workstation. Uh, Perfect, thanks, Titus. Um, we have another question here, it's a bit of a housekeeping question, which I can answer. Uh, someone's late because of another webinar. Um, if you missed the start of this webinar, you can just wait until we finish with the Q&A section, and then the webinar will be uploaded um, on demand so you can watch the whole thing. Moving on, the next question, can we compare Juju with OpenShift? I think that's a great question, and uh, I don't think we have uh, enough time uh, to fully answer this question during this webinar, but uh, I think uh, we're going to have some materials coming uh, about uh, differences between OpenShift and uh, using Juju on top of Kubernetes. Um, so uh, you can watch a bright talk for uh, a webinar about uh, this topic. Uh, but uh, just, uh, just just to make it quick, so uh, OpenShift is a platform as a service uh, solution that's available from Red Hat. It runs on top of uh, Red Hat's uh, OpenStack uh, platform, uh, and it's available as uh, per paid license. So this results with uh, increased uh, uh, operational cost and the vendor lock-in as uh, it only runs for on, on, on top of Red Hat infrastructure. Uh, Juju is a fully open source uh, tool that provides uh, multi-cloud SaaS experience. Uh, so it's more on the software as a service level than the platform as a service. Uh, it can run on top of uh, bare metal, Lexi, OpenStack, Kubernetes, public clouds. So it provides a much wider range of underlying um, uh, providers, uh, and uh, you can use it uh, free of charge. Perfect. Thank you, Titus. Um, now, we've crossed this off in a previous question, but I suppose there's no harm in, in going over it uh, in a bit more detail. Is, um, somebody who is on Ubuntu Server 1404 would like to know what the process is for them to upgrade. Right, so from any LTS, uh, you'll want to upgrade from LTS to LTS. And so uh, for 14.04, when you do the due release upgrade, it will prompt you to upgrade to 16.04, Xenial. You'll want to do that, make sure everything is in, the, in a happy state, and go to 18.04, and then finally to 20.04 as your final upgrade. This is a path that we test, right? Obviously, we want to make sure that the experience between LTSs stays consistent and that everything works coming out of it. 
Um, it's also with every new LPS, there might be things that become deprecated or um, are no longer supported. And so those are the things that, that uh, you know, you just have to watch out for. Um, but we, in our testing, we try to make sure that those things um, are covered and, you know, won't, won't cause an unbootable system, of course. Perfect. Thank you. The next question is, what's the ETA and what are the plans for Charmed OpenStack support for Usuri on 2004? I think that's a good question. So uh, we were surprised uh, when we uh, saw for the first time that uh, the uh, OpenStack Usuri uh, is going to be released uh, in May. Uh, as uh, you probably know, uh, the development cycles of Ubuntu and uh, OpenStack uh, used to be in sync uh, for years. Uh, but uh, OpenStack Usuri is coming. Uh, it's going to be generally available on May 13th. Uh, the uh, OpenStack Usuri packages are already available in a technical preview state, uh, but uh, will be fully available with uh, commercial support uh, starting with the upstream release. It is also important to mention that uh, Charmed, uh, canonical Charmed OpenStack distribution relies on OpenStack Charms to uh, deploy and uh, operate uh, OpenStack. And uh, a full commercial support for Usuri will come with uh, OpenStack Charms release uh, 2005, which is expected on May 20th. And uh, we're going to have a separate uh, webinar about uh, the new features coming in OpenStack Usuri. So this is where uh, we'll cover all of the all of the kind of uh, supportability uh, concerns as well. So uh, I would encourage you to you. to join this webinar. Thanks, Titus. Uh, the next question is: Will twenty oh four support MAS? Of course, it will support MAS, and uh, MAS is one of our core products uh, that is designed for bare metal provisioning. It provides uh, bare metal cloud experience, so uh, you can just put it in your data center, uh, turn it on, and it will automatically discover all of the physical devices uh, and, and virtual machines running in your data center. Uh, it provides a kind of an IP address management uh, feature as well. And uh, what's the most important, uh, you can automate uh, bare metal provisioning uh, using MAS. So yes, MAS is one of our core products. It will be definitely, actually it is, definitely supported in Ubuntu Server 2004. Brilliant. Um, and the next question is, where is the Discourse Forum? You can find that at discourse.ubuntu.com. Easy. Um, it looks like that's all the time we have for questions, unfortunately, guys. Uh, we've got a hard stop at 6 p.m. Um, UK time, so I'm afraid we're going to have to call it there on the questions. Um, I do see that we have quite a few questions which we haven't got around to answering, so I'd encourage everybody who has a question that's been left unanswered, please make use of the contact form in the attachment section, and um, one of our experts will be able to get back to you. Um, it's also worth noting, uh, like I mentioned previously, that this webinar will be made on demand shortly after this. So if you'd like to come back and view it at time of your choosing and work through it at your own pace, um, then please do so. So all that is left to say is um, Titus and Josh, thank you very much for an excellent presentation and a great Q&A. And to everybody who's watching, uh, have a lovely rest of your day.